Chapter 4. A Not Ideal Party Guest Well hello and welcome to today's episode of Discourse of the Three Kingdoms. Uh, Jude and I are delighted that today we've been joined by Ben. Ben, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Hello, I'm very excited to be here. So I am Ben. Benjamin doesn't particularly matter which one. Uh, I've been on Tumblr as uh, the Archlish for way too long now, where I've given so many opinions, some good, some not. <laughs> like I imagine uh, a lot of people, I was first introduced to the Three Kingdoms through the uh, Koei Dynasty Warriors games and their Romance of the Three Kingdoms series. Played those when I was fairly young, had a good time. It wasn't until several years later when I was in my teens when I found out this was inspired by historical events and by the uh, by the novel, the Song Wo Yan Yi. And that led me to start digging much deeper, and I have been falling down that rabbit hole ever since. Well, we're very grateful that you've fallen down that rabbit hole, because as you've said, you've produced a lot of material over the years, and maybe some of the older stuff you wouldn't encourage people to read, but lots of it is wonderful. And we're very grateful for your hard work in uh, building the community and in uh, giving us more information. Uh, so Jude, why don't you give us a recap of the chapter just in case people can't remember everything that happens. Dong Zhe has via assassination and quick thinking seized power at court. With his opponents in flight, he decides to change the emperor, setting up the younger brother to rule. Taking the rank of chancellor, he controls the court with brutality and avarice. When the emperor Former emperor writes a poem. Li Ru is sent to throw the Dowager out of the window and to kill the emperor or the former emperor. There is dismay at court, a few failed assassinations, and Wang Yun is unable to move. But at a party, a brave young officer called Cao Cao offers to assassinate Dong Zhou. Alas, this goes a tiny bit wrong, and Cao Cao also ends up in flight, meeting a new friend and carrying out a murder, or several of them, were at a place of refuge. Thank you, Jude. Uh, so we will get on to Cao Cao uh, shortly. The person for whom this episode is named, a not ideal guest at a party. He certainly wouldn't be on my list of, of guests that I'd want at a party. But before we get there, we're going to discuss... Dong Zhuo uh, being in control. Uh, this this chapter begins, doesn't it, with Yu and Xiao uh, fleeing after um, expressing his disgust at Dong Zhuo's plan to change the emperor. Ben, how historically accurate is that? Well, that can be a little hard to say. To a large degree, what we have in the uh, novel here matches up with. Uh, our usual historical account of the uh, confrontation between the two. The trouble is that account is not necessarily accurate. Uh, one of the, uh, the great commentator of the uh, Sanguizhe, Pei Songzhe, uh, expressed doubts about the truth of this story just based on logical grounds. The idea that under these circumstances, Yuan Shao could get away with having this argument, this opposition to Dong Zhuo, to the point where they draw swords on each other and that he would just be allowed to walk away from that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If anyone was going to be allowed to get away with doing that, might it be Yuan Shao because of his family's standing? If there was one person who could do it, it probably would be him, given just the power that the Yuan family wielded and particularly Yuan Shao himself as sort of a representative of the aristocracy, maybe he could have gotten away with it. So it's it's possible, but there are, we got questions. Dong Xiao certainly couldn't harm Yuan Shao off when Yuan Shao went to flight. Uh, he needed the grand tutor, Yuan Shao's uncle, for political support. And Yuan Shao as sort of a leading man of the leading family, it would be a very bad look for a regime to assassinate or kill Yon Chao. It was when Dong, when Yon Chao's allies were telling Dong Zhou 
you just best give an appointment and soothe it down. It wasn't loyal advice, but it wasn't necessarily a bad advice for Dong Zhuo to take. He could not so blatantly kill such a man at this point in his new regime. So it might not have been sensible to, but I, one of the themes, I think, of Dong Zhuo being in control is that he doesn't always do the sensible political play. Is that fair? Um, he doesn't seem that bothered with how he is viewed by uh, the public. We'll, we'll come on to a really extreme example of that right at the end of this section. But what matters is that Yuan Xiao is no longer in the court, and that will become really significant um, in a chapter or two's time. And uh, his main opponent has left. So Dong Zhuo is in a position to do what he wants. And so he decides he's going to get rid of the emperor and the emperor's mother, the dowager. Um, how does he go about doing that? He summons the court assembly, uh, having got permission from the grand tutor, and accuses the emperor of being unfilial, of unworthy conduct, and that he needs to go. He also accuses the dowager of uh, murdering of for her former rival, improperly teaching the emperor himself, and of just general unworthy conduct, and so she should be locked up. So let's just remind ourselves that the empress dowager at this time is Empress Her, the sister of Her Jin, who obviously was killed at the end of the last chapter. Ben, what do you make of the charges that Dong Zhuo levels against her that she had her rival murdered? Well, as far as all of our evidence goes, that one's actually probably true. Uh, yeah, I find the Dowager to be an interesting figure because in both uh, the novel and a lot of the uh, history is written, she's presented as a very passive figure who things happen to her, she signs the paperwork, and everyone else is making the moves. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that she was a much more dynamic and involved uh, politician than that. That's, That's really the- interesting, because in our last episode, we were talking about how uh, women in politics was kind of frowned upon, and that's very much the way that she's presented um, in the novel. So so in what ways was she more dynamic in real life in history than the novel presents? So looking back to our oldest uh, accounts of Empress He, what we see is that shortly before she came to her position, uh, her predecessor was a woman of the Song family who previously had the emperor's favor before all of her various rivals uh, slandered her, drove her out of power, and got her relatives executed. Uh, She herself, quote, died of grief, which is often a synonym for suicide, sometimes enforced suicide. Empress He took her position shortly after that, and we we can say with some amount of certainty that she was certainly involved in slandering and removing her predecessor. Okay, so she had manipulated the situation to elevate herself to that rank. Um, now, let's just ask that question. Dao Dong has the same surname as Dong Zhuo. Were they related? No. Dong Zhuo liked to claim it to give himself legitimate support, but they were if there was any 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 connection, it would be fo- so far distant, and there was no connection made by people until Dong Zhuo started claiming it. They would just happen to share the same name, as far as anyone can tell. If there'd been a close connection, he probably wouldn't have survived her fall, would he? Ultimately, yeah. so we we know that there's no close family relation from that very basic piece of evidence, um, at least. So Jude, I know that you'd like to. Uh, talk to us a little bit about um, Empress Dowager Dong's death. What would you like to tell us? I want to bring it up because it is the excuse that Dong Zhou uses to depose Dowager He, and it's not without reason that he would use that, apart from his claim to be a relative. While Dowager Dong may not have been a popular figure with the accusations of corruption, it was one of Thing, her losing a political battle but it was a PR disaster for the, her family in that 
only a few months after Emperor Ling had died, his wife had essentially removed Emperor Ling's mother from court. And then the mysterious death of Ionis, just a few weeks later after her removal, it just looked unfeel. It was an unpopular mark against the re- new regime that, and there was something Dong Zhou was happy to use that the widespread suspicion, which let's be honest, it was clearly murder uh, of her death. Look, who gets along with their mother-in-law? Okay. Yes, be, but I don't advocate caught. murdering them ever. That is not well, the you right response. Uh, but uh, it it is a moment which perhaps shows us um, Dong Zhuo's got some political ability that he's able to pick up Not on much. something um, and uh, is able to use the already something that's already made Empress Her unpopular um, to great effect. So Dong Zhuo decides to dispose of the Emperor and Yun Shao, who is his main opponent on that, flees. But we do get in the novel um, a guy called Ding Guan and uh, Wu Fu um, upset about this. Sorry? How much of that is historically accurate? Wu Fu's real. He did try to uh, he did try to assassinate Dong Zhou with the unsurprising lack of success. But I think it's telling that the novel feels it needed to introduce another opponent. Like in the previous chapter, it made Ding Wan into a Han loyalist rather than a passive victim of assassination. Dong Zhou had very successfully intimidated the court. Okay, so the novel feels the need to really elevate the amount of um, opposition to Dong Zhuo compared to what was actually there in the court because the court were subdued. Why do you think the novel feels the need to do that? I think the novel just, it wants to show that this is a dynasty worth saving, that the loyal heroes, it, it wasn't so easily intimidated and making those that didn't make a stand look far worse. Whereas historically, you know, going up to the most powerful man in the empire who controls an army who is a famous warrior and trying to assassinate him is probably not going to end well. It was one of the things were scheming were thinking long term. They were sort of like Yon Shao fleeing abroad or well not abroad but out of the capital or like several of Yon Shao's agents acting as advisors to steer Dong Zhou into mistakes. So just going back to that assassination attempt, surprisingly not working when you're attacking a famous warrior. It was one of the things I noticed reading this chapter, because normally, or in lots of ways, the novel really downplays any strengths that Dong Zhuo might have, and it tries to make him just a a monster. Um, But the one bit of praise it does give him is that he's very strong. So when Wufu tries to kill him, um, he's able to hold... Uh, the weapon away from himself until help arrives because of because of his great strength. So um, that, that was something that stood out to me as I read this chapter. Uh, so something else happens, which I don't think the novel really shows us or gives us a sense of how significant it is. It's just kind of a throwaway line. But it says that a person called uh, Kai Yong is recruited by Dong Zhuo into the court. Um, who is this figure? And... It, why does his role matter? So Tsai Yong was an extremely respected scholar of the Han court. He was really one of their greatest uh, literati, a fantastic poet, a musician. His work was in extremely high demand. He was also a uh, noted reformer, particularly regarding a lot of the things like their various court rituals. The novel mentions him briefly in chapter one. Uh, where he opposes the eunuchs and gets exiled for it. This is true in that uh, Sai Yong was quite an active opponent of the eunuchs and had actually once been protected by the emperor because he'd been too stinging in his criticism. Unfortunately for Sai Yong, eventually he did push his luck too far and would end up by a brief amnesty which he then managed to get himself exiled again Spent, had spent t- 12 years away from court. When Dong Zhou, uh, ne- one way to make your regime look good and legitimate was to hire great people of renown to show, look, I'm accepted by the best. I am. I understand talent. Talent will thrive under me. And sort of adding Sai Yong would, would be like, say, a sports team, adding a 
50 million pound star player to for under a new owner or new manager to really sort of make a signal to everyone thank you so um it, it might be worth saying that before he was kicked out of court that um Cy Young had been part of something called the Tung Kwan, which was a core institution of learning for the Eastern Han. It was a building within the palace um, that only a very limited number of scholars were allowed to ac- um, to access. And it was meant to be a center for um, reforming thought, for uh, polymathy um, and debates about texts and rituals um, a- and developing new ideas and new approaches. So he, a- a- as you've both said, he was a giant um of the era so bringing him back in was seen as a really positive thing uh, and what does that say about dong Zhuo's wider sense of wanting to do reforms well i don't know how genuine his desire for reform was but he definitely made a good show of it at least at first he made a lot of effort to surround himself with reformers who had been exiled by the eunuch regime a lot of people who were very highly respected and renowned And it really, especially in these earliest days, gave his regime a lot of legitimacy that made it look like more than just a warlord who has seized power through force. Dong Zhou was very, very keen, not just for recruitment, but also to send such famous figures out to the provinces. Instead of sort of up and coming or not local figures, but sort of people who'd yet to prove themselves he was sending out established figures, famed scholars, to take up posts across the land to, again, to look good to the public, to act as a reassurance. He himself promoted reformers uh, in terms of sacrificing to former opponents of the eunuchs. He personally restrained rewards to his own family. When Sayong proposed a series of changes to the Han temples, to limit the amount of sacrifices and honors given. Dong Zhuo drove that through, though that was not without controversy because it was essentially going, I, Dong Zhuo, this new ruler, can judge what the entire Han history and decide who was a worthy emperor, who was not. A lot of Dong Zhuo's actions and reforms, though some were indeed well intentioned, probably well intentioned by either him or those trying to bring it through also furthered the idea that Dong Zhou had no sense of propriety, that he was a violent usurper who was basically looking at a quite broken Han and just doing what he wanted with no considerations of how things should be done. And so when Dong Zhou did arrive at the Bari Palace, there was a, was a confrontation with some officials. And there's various accounts of what he said, but one of them, as well as a threat to crack open someone's head was on the lines of the palace is on fire the emperor is in flight who are you to say that i shouldn't be acting and that i should go away he basically not unreasonably thought the court gentry had had its time and made a complete and utter horlicks of it interesting so you've uh, said quite a lot there there are a few things i'd like to pick up on so first of all you talked about figures that were uh, prominent people that were given posts in different provinces and, and there will be names here that i think lots of our listeners will be familiar with and they might not be aware that they were dong Zhuo's uh, appointments for example leo biao um who was the governor of jing province uh was at an appointment by dong dong Zhuo. Uh, and then i want to pick up on what you were saying about the fact that he was a controversial reformer, but do you think the fact that he was bringing in court officials who had been exiled under the eunuchs may be one of the reasons why there was not so much opposition to him at the central court? Because although he was doing things that may not have been universally popular, at least the right people in the minds of the court officials were being given rank again. What what do you think? I, if it hadn't done certain other actions and seized the court by military means as an outsider, I could see that. But I do think there was a lot of fear. He beat one of when one official didn't uh, show appropriate respect. He beat him to death. So I think a lot of it was about fear and sort of uncertainty about this new regime. 
That's fair. So he ruled through fear, really, rather than any sense yeah. of respect. I mean, a lot of some of those he did hire, like So Young, were very much because, hey, I know where your family lives, or I will kill you if you do not come. So, yeah, so well, he didn't well, give them that much choice. Yeah, a lot so of these good. people were not necessarily there of their own volition. It's hard to say no to the guy with the army, but by surrounding himself with these people, these, you know, these scholars, these reformers, often uh, members or at least retainers of the aristocracy, it allowed him to put this veneer of respectability over what he did. But then the slightest crash that surface and what you see is a brutal warlord who is perfectly happy to just kill you and move on. Yeah. And that brings us really neatly, I think, to the next point I was going to ask us to discuss. So whilst we've been thinking about the veneer of respectability, let's scratch onto the surface and see um, uh, the death of the emperor. So in the novel, it's absolutely brutal. Um, Li Ru comes in and he's got a glass of wine in one hand and a silk rope in the other. And he basically gives the emperor a choice of which one he wants to die by and the same for the dowager um dowager basically refuses to drink the wine and so instead of using the silk robe a uh, silk rope he just throws her out the window so absolutely brutal <laughs> is that what happened in history no uh dowager hey due to her position and uh her strength of character she one of the reasons she caught the emperor ling's eye was her sense of authority and she showed a willingness to stand up to her brother and the gentry at times. But that was obviously going to be a problem for Dong Zhuo. So within a day of deposing her, it, she died of grief in uh, the palace prisons, essentially. So alas, no ch- chucking out the window to check if there was a trampoline, which is, I'm sure is what Libri was aiming for. I'm sure that's what was going on in his head. So uh, the dowager, um, Empress Her died at a different time to the emperor in history um who was it who killed the emperor in history was it li ru very much so and it's historically the only real action we know him from but the novel uses which presumably means he was a trusted official he's been he'd been put in charge of the uh former emperor's confinement and wasn't trusted enough to do that but we know very little about him the not uh, earlier fiction, like Pingwa, turned him into the trusted advisor for Dong Zhuo. But yeah, historically, it was just his one deed. Yeah, there's not a whole lot we can necessarily extrapolate from that. We, you know, we try, and especially for the purposes of building this narrative, he's as he's a reasonable choice for someone to fill this evil advisor role. But really, all we do know about him for sure is that he did kill the emperor and we can't say much more about him i do wonder if the reason why he was chosen to do this uh, to fill that role of advisor is because killing the emperor was a really significant act and that wasn't really something that um the author wanted to give to a nobody so the nobody that did it had to get elevated into a bigger figure um but that's just speculation on my part but um yeah so how how did the emperor Dies in, as in, did he die whimpering or, or did he deliver us a poem? One thing Dong Zhou was very successful at, possibly the only act of propaganda he was really managed to pull off, was his portrayal of uh, Emperor Bion as a weakling, sort of indecisive in the moment of crisis, a little prone to crying. Uh, and the novel kind of takes this theme further. It shows him a bit of, a bit of poetry, a bit of defiance, but essentially that his mother is more, the more powerful figure. And but his he, consort. And uh, his the cons- consort says, let me die instead. And um, whilst he's just sitting there passively in, in the mm-hmm. novel. Um, so you're right. The, the novel really presents him as completely passive, completely mm-hmm. subdued, doing whatever he's told. Yeah. I mean, in the chapter, in his fl- flight, it's his younger brother who does, who acts as the driver. We need to move. We, that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, historically, uh, we're not entirely certain of his age. There's two, there's two accounts which shows how, but little in fact he had on history, unfortunately. But uh, and we don't hear much of him as a potential ruler. We do have the account of his death, and we do have his final words, including sort of 
when he knew he was going to die, he had a banquet with his uh, ladies who were actually understandably quite upset. And uh, I believe Benjamin and I are going to read the final poem. Since the emperor gets overlooked and passively portrayed, we thought it would be nice to give his historical goodbyes. And uh, we're using the translation from The Last Emperor by Yang Seng Yun. Great book that everyone should buy, frankly. Yes, I second that. It's a fantastic source. Heaven's way changes. Ah, I have what troubles. Abandoning 10,000 chariots are withdrawing as a vassal. From rebellious minister meeting force, ah, life not lasting. Passing and about to leave you, ah, going to secluded and dark. Thank you, that's interesting. Um, And Ben, will you read us uh, Tang Ji's response? Yes, of course. August sky collapses, lordly earth decays, self as emperor, life early broken. Death and life, paths differ from this separating, how we are alone in hearts grieving. Thank you. Uh, now, don't panic. We're not going to become a poetry podcast. But is there anything that stands out to you? Because uh, those are historical last words. So a- anything jump out to either of you there? Well, you really do feel the, you know, the sorrow coming through there, obviously. This is a real sad and upsetting situation. There's a lot of sorrow here, but also a sense of resignation. There's not, you know, no protestation left. There's an understanding that there's no way out of this it's just a sad fate that they have to accept the descriptions in the records that after tang jie's last dance they all sobbed and she was crying into a sleeve as she was saying these last words to think of that when you know you're for the emperor to think of a poem as he knows he's going to die that at just such a young age he's going to meet his fate he'd not had a chance to rule or to usually live He'd not even had an empress when he talked about he's going to secluded it in the dark. That, that I find touching. Things like this, I think, are very important for uh, everyone to really internalize because it's a great reminder that, you know, we see these people as characters in books or various other adaptations. And things like this are an excellent and very poignant reminder that these are real, full human beings. We do have one final word from the now king, and just as he's about to take the drugs offered to send him on his way, he tells Tang Jing, his favourite, that you were king's consort and there should never again be an official or commoner's wife. From here, I forever take leave. It was an instruction to someone he seems to have loved and a reflection on how he viewed his status and telling her not to marry. It's a promise. In the novel, she's killed, but in the, historically, she did live on, and it's a promise she kept despite immense pressure. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, it's the last line is he knows he's about to what he's about to do, and he seems to have done it com- with composure and calmness under what must have been very distressing circumstances. And again, he would have been living for months in a effective a golden cage, waiting. Or events to happen. Thank you for, um, I think, bringing home to us the reality of what this is. And kind of, as you said, Ben, these are real human figures, not just um, not just characters on a page, which is so tempting to to see them as. Um, and as we see one instance of Dong Zhuo's brutality here, the novel follows it on. Dong Zhuo uh, goes for a ride, essentially, seems to take some soldiers with him, sees a festival going on, decides not to join in with the festival, instead to kill all the men, take all the women back to be um, his women, and to steal all the property that was there, which is just horrific. He's almost as bad a party guest as Sao Sao is, to be honest. So um, was that historically accurate? Unfortunately, yes. This was about something very much... It, he claimed it a great victory to celebrate against bandits. There's no circumstances where this would have been okay. But it's not like he needed to do it. His forces had just recently defeated actual band raids. He was a famed commander. It was just an ugly act of brutality. 
to taking in some villagers' wealth and just taking some heads to make a grisly celebration and perhaps to terrify the court. Look at what I can do and I'm willing to do. Mm, I think it's, you know, things like this are what show us the real Dong Zhuo. Because we we spent maybe more time than we necessarily should have talking about the things he did that did seem respectable and that were, you know, intelligent or at least logical. And then we get something like this that reminds us that this is just a very, very bad man who does very bad things because he wants to and no one can stop him. You don't bring us, you don't, you forget to take off your sword, he beats you to death. Mm -hmm. Your potential rival in your way, no matter what your status or your loyalty, you'll be killed, deposed or killed. Well, basically, just killed. Right. So he can he can prop up Cy Young and others like him to give him this sense of legitimacy. But when you get down to it, and you don't have to go very far down, this is the real Dong Zhuo. It was a mixture for a, a rule of respectability by the use of scholars and his use of troops to running rampaging through the streets. Basically, who's going to stop me? I control the army. I can do what I want. He did what, do what he wanted for the most part. His rank of chancellor, for example, had not been used by the latter Han at all. It, it was an extraordinary statement from someone who had been ruling for a few months to basically set himself up above every latter Han minister in history. Yeah, that's a declaration of arrogance, isn't it? If there ever was one. Um, mm -hmm. But also his unassailable, or at least how it appeared, unassailable power uh, which i think is a good place to finish that first theme so having seen the um the veneer that he tried to present the brutality that uh, was underneath but the fact that he was getting away with it because he was just so powerful but it shouldn't be a surprise when someone's behaving that way that there is a plot to go against them uh, and in the novel that plot takes shape. Uh, Wang Yun, who this is the first time we meet him and we'll discuss him in just, just a few moments, uh, throws a party and he invites Cao Cao, who uh, he's one of his guests. Yet again, he's going to ruin a second party. Partway through the party, Wang Yun breaks down in tears and says, isn't it awful? Dong Zhuo is a terrible human being, which we're all saying, yes, he is. Do something about it. And he tries to encourage people to do something about it. And Cao Cao laughs and says, I know how we can fix this. I'm going to kill him for you. Um, how much of that is historically accurate? Oh, boy. Um, I guess the little laugh probably gave it away. As much of as fun as this part of the story it is, it is all pure fiction. Yeah, we've wandered off section, has a lot of historical basis with a bit of exaggeration into the novel is just making stuff up now. Okay, so none of this is historically accurate. Um, was Cao Cao a significant enough figure that he would have been? Um, so, so in, in the novel, he's invited into Dong Zhuo's presence um, with a knife or a jeweled sword or whatever it is um, to assassinate Dong Zhuo. W was he important enough that Dong Zhuo would ever have let him into his presence? Cao Cao was a real small fish at this time. You know, he had some amount of reputation was named. His father had been a very important official, but all the positions he held up to this point were pretty minor, you know, governing counties, being a colonel during the rebellion, lots of real small things. He was, this was not Yuan Shao, who maybe could have just shown up whenever he wanted to. Cao Cao was a real, as far as the aristocracy goes, at least, a very mid to low level kind of guy. When Dong Zhou is supposed to have a private chat with Yuan Chao about his plans, you can believe that. If Dong Zhou was having a private chat with Cao Cao, you'd, with Cao Cao's status at this point, you'd be wondering who's, li who's lying in the records. The novel wants to make Cao Cao a driving force. We saw him earlier being promoted as one of Hei Jin's key men when he, when he had no role under Hei Jin. And now we're getting sort of this man that He's the sole man at the party of all the great ministers and officials at state. They all weep and are helpless. But Cao Cao, the driving dynamic figure, is the only one who comes up with the plan. And that's deliberate promotion of Cao Cao as a big radical figure. 
So I promised audience we will stop making jokes at some point about Leo Bay and Sao Sao being elevated to a level of importance that they don't deserve. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to say this is a history podcast and we are going to point out places where the novel is being historically um, inaccurate. So Sao Sao has been elevated once again um, to a place of importance. But how about his co-conspirator? Who was Wang Yun and was he uh, someone of importance? Wang Yun was not necessarily a hugely important figure at this point, but he was a very interesting figure who certainly had some fame. So in in our novel here, he's generally depicted as a uh, as sort of a meek old man who, when he does accomplish anything, it's just through some, you know, cunning and guile. The real Wang Yun was a bit more interesting than that. He was from the uh, Han frontier up in Bing province. And while he was a noted scholar who studied classical literature, he was also noted for being very good at writing and shooting. He was, at heart, a military man from the frontier. Yeah, so Interesting. He was, also, uh, he was a man of action. Uh, he'd fought against the turbans uh, quite successfully. He'd been a prominent opponent of the eunuchs, including getting involved in murders and acts of violence in the provinces, then being what and becoming such a problem at court that there was an attempt to move against him by the eunuchs. And even his own friends were going, you're doomed, just take this poison and ex- and avoid disgrace. He decided to stand up against that and managed to uh, put up a fierce defense of himself, which didn't entirely save him from trouble, but did get the death sentence reduced. Right. Uh, at the start of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, because he was a martially minded person, he was assigned to be uh, the head of Yu province, which is actually where both uh, Cao Cao and Sung Jian fought the uh, turbans. So we actually had all those three together in one place at one point, which is a fun little fact. Uh, I should you... mention he did appear in Chapter 2. Uh, he's sort of directing affairs Mm-hmm. into helping get the emperor back but he he was one of he's perhaps one of the few thinkers during that time of crisis who thought oh perhaps the emperor's going missing might be a bad problem send a posse after them so he sounds like he was rather more competent than maybe some of his rivals both in the fact he managed to successfully stand up against the eunuchs and survive doing so and he decided that maybe going looking for the emperor was a good idea so right. uh, this assassination attempt against Don Zhuo was fictional. I'm not going to say anything more than that because it's a spoiler, but you might be able to guess where it's going next. Right. This was not the kind of man to sit here and cry at a party rather than do something about it. He was a man of action. He might have done both. We we did have a conversation on our, our last episode about how um, not crying is very much a Western mark of a man or a british mark of a man rather than necessarily the mark of being manly in in other contexts but you're right he wouldn't just sit at a party and cry he might sit at a party and cry and then do something about his tears okay so sao sao takes this jaw dagger in uh working on this plan with his co-conspirator what happens when he comes face to face with dong zhuo they become best friends (laughs) so he comes face to face with dong zhuo and he's this puts Sao Tso in a tricky position where he wants to kill Dong Zhuo, but Lu Bu is also there. So as an excuse for coming late, Sao Tso says, well, my horse is bad. Dong Zhuo says, okay, Lu Bu, you know horses, go get him a better horse. So he uses this trick to get Lu Bu out of the room. Uh, he Crafty. then approaches Dong Zhuo. Very clever. He then approaches Dong Zhuo to stab him, but uh, Dong Zhuo sees him creeping up. Uh, Sao Tso, right at that moment, Lu Bu returns with the horse. Sao Tso pretends he was making a gift of the fancy knife, uh, takes the nice new horse, and flees into the night. Okay. So what does that tell us about Sao Tso's character? Well, I think narratively, this is a really big moment for Sao Tso as a character because it establishes a lot of key features of his personality that we really only got some shades of earlier. On the one hand, it demonstrates that he's brave enough to try and kill Dong Zhuo. He's very active. He's someone who's trying to fix a problem while everyone else is just standing around crying about it. It also demonstrates that he's extremely cunning. First, he tricks Lu Bu into leaving the room. 
And then when he gets caught, he comes up with a good bluff to get out of it and gets a nice horse in the deal. But we also have an element of selfishness to it. In, uh, in our novel here, he's well-liked enough to meet with Dong Zhuo whenever he wants, so really he could have killed Dong Zhuo at any time. He only does it after announcing that he's doing it at the party so that he gets credit for it, right? Like, he could have done this at any time. The only reason to wait until now is so that everyone knows he was going to do it. Uh, he likewise, wants to be a hero. Right. Likewise, a selfless man, say the novel's version of Liu Bei, probably would have just stabbed Dong Zhuo regardless, even if, even if it meant that Lu Bu would immediately kill him. Cao yeah. Cao doesn't do that. Instead, he flees because his life is more important to him than this. Yeah. Well, it doesn't outright condemn Cao Cao. It's interesting that you got Ding Guan, a uh, Wu Fu, uh, earlier as a contrast. Mm -hmm. They were bold enough and get poems for their, their efforts against Dong Zhuo. But when the punch moment comes, Sal Sal, for uh, understandable reasons, pulls out because he's been spotted. It's not going to end well. Mm -hmm. And he also, usually he hesitates a little because, because of uh, in, because he's not, he needs to get the blow right, even though Dong Zhou is having a lie down for what well, it just seems weird. Be honest, just it's it's a, a strange thing to do when your friend shows up. There's a comment from the editor of the novel, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, that he says Cao Cao had this all as a backup plan, that he was that he was think that just in case it went wrong, he was going to present it a knife. I personally don't think that. I think, I mean, it's not the most convincing lie, and it's a bit of weird that Li Bu and Dong Zhou go, oh yeah, that's fine, you're giving me a knife, that's awesome, but. I think it's more in the moment he hesitates and he's not quite a true enough hero to do it rather than this was a grand plan. So the reason the novel gives for Cao Cao fleeing is clearly false. Um, the whole of that assassination attempt is fictional. But Ben, did he need to flee the court? Well, he didn't necessarily need to flee, but he did. We don't have any like uh, specific inciting incident like, oh, he tried to kill Dong Zhuo and failed, so he had to get out of there. But he did end up fleeing the capital. Uh, at the time when Dong Zhuo took power, Cao Cao was at court basically as a sort of vaguely titled consultant. Uh, Dong Zhuo gave him a position as a uh, colonel in the army. But Cao Cao had already decided by that point that he was going to do whatever he could to oppose Dong Zhuo. So he decided to flee under a false name to go back to his home region and help raise an army to fight Dong Zhuo. Okay, so uh, Cao Cao is now fleeing, which is our third theme. What happens when he flees? Well, he's caught and arrested, and he comes face to face with the magistrate of the town. Who was that magistrate, and what happens next? The magistrate is a man called Chen Gong, who knows Cao Cao from his past time at court and so he, while he makes a show of arresting the villainous Cao Cao who now want, wanted posters everywhere after the talk with Cao Cao about why he did it Chen Gong decides he's found a worthy master a worthy hero that releases Cao Cao and uh, they go off into the night together body comedy forever okay and in history was it Chen Gong that was the magistrate that released Cao Cao? Uh, historically, no. It's some unnamed petty official. Uh, narratively, it there's a justification for bringing Chen Gong into it now because he's someone who will come up later. And bringing him in now and establishing this relationship with Cao Cao does help to contextualize later actions. So you yes. can see the narrative reason for it. But this one is just, uh, again, pure fiction. Thank you. We might return back to this moment when we get to that later action. But I can't say anything more than that without giving a spoiler away. So, in the novel, Chen Gong and Cao Cao disappear off, having uh, left that city behind. And uh, Cao Cao says, ah, I've got a family friend just down the road. Uh, they'll look after us. Let's go and see them. What happens? 
they are greeted warmly. Uh, Lou Boccio unfortunately had not planned for this arrival, so he went goes off to pick up some wine, some party favors, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, Chen, Cao Cao and to some extent Chen Gong are a little paranoid, and they start hearing scraping of knives and tie him up, and fearing that in fact this uh, uncle wasn't really his uncle, but just sort of a family friend, Cao Cao encourages Chen Gong that they have to strike now before they themselves are captured and killed. And so they wander around the house killing all their hosts. And then they discovered the trussed up pig that was meant to be served to them. Oh dear, that doesn't look good. So it's one uh, of those wacky misunderstandings. Yeah. <laughs> wacky misunderstanding. That is another massive understatement i feel but yes we'll describe it as a wacky misunderstanding um so they do the logical thing they flee before uh Lubusche comes home and sees that they've massacred his family for no reason but they bump into him on the road don't they awkward awkward um I hate it when that happens yeah i i have you just no tried experience. to murder someone in peace why do people keep coming back and having to be interrupt you on your flight yeah, I'm afraid I have no experience of this, but I'll take your word for it that it's inconvenient and awkward. Um, so Sao Sao um, kind of says, oh, I've got to run. I don't have that much time. I don't want to bring trouble down your family. Um, go, go, go. Um, Loboche kind of shrugs his shoulders and goes home, only for Sao Sao to turn around and kill him um, to Chen Gong's horror. Uh, he's like, well, why did you need to do that? We know that he's innocent. And he was like, well, if if I didn't kill him, he would alert the authorities and everything would get worse for us. Um, so go from misunderstanding to just outright murder. Ben, is this what happened in history, do we think? Well, that's very complicated. This is probably one of the most complicated little sections of uh, history versus fiction. because We, we have like complicated here. That sounds good to me. Yeah, so we have multiple accounts is the trouble here. And the first thing to note is that in the base uh, Senglusia biography of Cao Cao, uh, Chen Shou doesn't mention this incident at all. While it's dangerous to try and make too many assumptions from silence, that might be an indication that he didn't think any of this happened. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to read too much into that. Our oldest version of this incident comes from the uh, Wei Shu. And what does that say? So that is rather similar to the uh, novel's account, where Cao Cao is traveling back to his hometown. Uh, instead of going alone or with Cheng Gong, he's got some uh, unnamed uh, followers of his, presumably people who had served under him during his military time. Uh, he stops at the uh, house of an old friend, Lu Bo Shi, uh, who is not home at the time. His sons are there with some of their guests, and they try to rob Cao Cao to take his horse and presumably whatever money he had with him. Uh, Cao Cao and his followers fight back, uh, kill several of them, and then, uh, uh, then leave. So that's really quite different, and in those circumstances, Cao Cao's actions seem quite justified. Um, right. Does any historical source give an account that's similar to the version in the novel? Yeah, so there's two subsequent accounts that uh, we don't know exactly when they were written, but we know these authors lived later than the Wei Shu uh, compilers. Uh, our first one of those from the Shi Yu says that uh, it agrees that uh, Lu Bo Shi was out, uh, his sons were home, but in this version, they prepared to uh, welcome Cao Cao with a party. But because Cao Cao had recently betrayed Dong Zhuo and suspected that people were plotting against him, he uh, attacks them in the middle of the night, kills eight of them, and then flees. A different focus. <laughs> Once right. again, do not invite Cao Cao to a party. It's not a good plan. He ruins everything he touches. And then we've got our third account from Sun Sheng, who uh, says, he, he adds on to that previous account saying that Cao Cao heard the sound of them preparing food 
uh, mistook that for planning to kill him, uh, then attacks them in the night. Uh, following all of this, he sorrowfully is quoted as saying, uh, I would rather betray the world than let the world betray me. And that is one of Salso's most iconic lines. So we'll mm. come back to that in just a moment. But uh, so what we're saying is we don't really know what happened here. It may be that the whole encounter with Loboche never happened. It may be that he was justified in defending himself from some of his sons, or it could be an account which is not dissimilar to what happened in the novel actually took place. We don't know. The sources are split, um, which means it's quite a good piece of fiction for the author to use. Um, and so let's come back to that line. I'd rather betray the world before the world betrayed me. That, that line is synonymous with Sao Sao, isn't it? It's probably his most, the, when you think of Sao Sao, that's the line you think of. It may have been said historically, it may not have. That's what we've just decided. Why do you think it has such strong connections with him going forward when it's of such dubious origin? Well, I think that uh, even if this story is not true and he didn't necessarily say this, I do think it is a very accurate sort of representation of his overall mentality and behavior. Like the title Hero of Chaos has become associated with Sal Sal. It can either be viewed as Sal Sal is on a trustworthy sort who's if push came to shove, would stab you in the back rather than defend you. But for in more modern times when people turn to Salsal as a pragmatic hero, it comes to symbolize his necessary, air quotes, ruthlessness. It becomes a sort of badge of pride of his clever thinking. Whereas historically, if he did say it, it was seems to be something sad with regret. I don't think that would have been the line he wanted to be associated with him. Interesting. Okay, so um, he said the famous line, and then the chapter is drawing to a close. Uh, Chen Gong is feeling a bit disillusioned. He's left his office. He let this man go at great personal risk, um, and now he's been encouraged to take place in a brutal murder of an innocent man's family. Ben, would you finish for us by reading that poem? A good man cannot have a bane-filled mind. Dong Zhuo and Cao Cao proved two of a kind. Was this the end of Cao Cao? So what will Chen Gong do? That's the cliffhanger that we are leaving you with. Cao Cao come... dies. Cao Cao dies. Cao Cao dies. <laughs> Cao Cao dies in chapter three. It turns, chapter out, five. The, it turns out Dong Zhuo was Chen Gong all along. <laughs> To find out if any of those are remotely plausible, you'll have to come back and listen to our next episode. Well, in fact, it won't be our next episode because our next episode is going to be a deep dive into the fall of the Han. Um, so it'll be the episode after that. So we'll have to come back in a month's time to find out. Uh, but in the meantime, Ben, we're so grateful that you've uh, joined us today. Um, Happy to be here. And we look forward to having you back at a later date. Um, but for now, it's goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.